Ready to truck it. We're coming to you live from the North American Logistics Tech Summit. I'm Dooner here with Michael Vincent, the dude. How are you, man? I'm doing great, man. Beautiful summer day out here. Yeah. Blue skies, a little bit of clouds, and Nalt, brother. Yeah. Hope you all got your blood sugar up, had a nice meal, went to the gather rounds presented by Load Shore, and had a great time connecting with people there. You know, this is the show where we don't talk about freight in a monotone because no. we are the left and right Twix. Can I be the left one and much tastier? <laughs> you are on the left side, man. Well, I mean, they're... Are well, they either so? way, we're not talking about monotones and left and right Twix coming at you in stereo. And this is going to be a great show today because we have the opportunity to speak to Project 44 and Zanetta, Deep Analytics, Visibility, all of those kind of things, cracking down this market, which has been incredibly challenging. Uh, oh, before man, we went yeah. to break, we were talking about that invoice. $1,500, $15,000 to go from Yantian to Long Beach, and um, and that seems like a good deal. So it's a wild time. It seems time. like a good deal. Remember I told you about that that, that container was going from uh, Durban, South Africa to United States, and yeah. they, they took it around through Hong Kong and over to the West Coast instead of coming straight East Coast, right? Yes. It got to Hong Kong. You know what they did? What did they do? They turned it around. It's wild, man. But then you look at some things like pears. <laughs> I was opening a, a package yep. of pears, right? And the pears, which were grown in Brazil, were packaged in Thailand and sent to the United States. And if you look at a map, it's a lot of miles. Yeah, it is. Unnecessary it is. miles. You know, they used to send uh, cornflakes that way, too, until they discovered they were covering cocaine. Oh, yes. If you remember. Oh, yes, from that story. <laughs> yes, I believe uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> You got to check that one. Hey, you know, the best thing about these, these virtual events is uh, it's not always our, our typical audience here on What the Truck. If you are a member of our typical audience, you would know that we come at you live Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays at noon Eastern time on Freight Waves TV. You can also listen to us on demand, podcast players everywhere. Just look up What the Truck or look up Freightcast and you get every single Freight Waves podcast all on one feed, including all of the sessions from today's event. So you miss something, hey, we understand. It's all on demand. It's not, it's not Clubhouse. It's not F Memorial. You, know, you can go and check this stuff out later. No. But one of the great things is we get to bring together the logistics community, and a lot of them love having a platform like this. Jonathan Porter says, good to hear another advocate for cloud in the supply chain. It's time for supply chain organizations to fully embrace the benefits of cloud-native tech. But, you know, oh, Michael yeah. Vincent, for a long time, the thinking was that you needed your own metal, you needed your own servers, the cloud yeah. was dangerous. Dangerous, the cloud could be hacked and all of those kind of things. But that's changed rather rapidly. And, is, and some of the hacks that we've seen recently or the ransomware attacks have come on servers that are located right within the companies going against that, defying that thinking of cloud-based logistics. Yeah, I think, and I think there's, there's uh, some, I mean, there's a reasons for that, right? It's, it's very expensive. It's hard to upgrade. It's hard to get more memory and that type. And plus the, the, the cloud computing and with the infiltration of all the IOT devices, et cetera, yeah. there's so much more better data out there than you got you got to expand. Right. Absolutely. There sure is. You know, Evan Bassinet, he said, hey, everybody, excited to see technology and cloud. Another one, a cloud at the forefront of this essential industry. Great topics discussed so far. And you and I have both worked on the operations side, and we lived in a world yeah. where um, cloud-based computing, not, not huge at the time when we no, were doing it. No, you know? not at all. Faxes, emails, lost communication. Who tough remembers to the Twix? <laughs> he used to send Twixes to the AS400. Oh, jeez. Jeez. The dot matrix printer. <laughs> Those faxes, all old tech, outdated. We're going to hear about all the cool and new stuff. One thing I got passionate about, though, was that yeah. economic threat versus a national security threat. Now, tell me why you think they're the exact same thing. <laughs> I, I don't think they're the exact same thing. I argued with you that they were the exact okay. same thing because I like to take the opposite argument. Sure. I just, I put forth the question, is is there a difference? And it seems like it gets really clouded these days. And I think it's an important thing that Sant, uh, Santosh brought up, our yeah. keynote speaker brought up, is that you need to be thinking about just how critical it is, not only to your company, mm. but obviously with the new infrastructure bill and Joe Biden's administration looking into the different supply chains. And stuff, it's about time, and I think we all cheered when he said they were going to look into this type of stuff because it it can be used as a weapon uh, of war. Yeah, no, right? I would agree with you. I mean, I, I I think we're seeing those impacts as we are stuck in this perpetual peak season yeah. of what can happen to a stressed supply chain. And, Absolutely. You know, there's been some there's been some hacks and ransomware attacks. Uh, there's been a ship stuck in the Suez Canal. There was a COVID outbreak in the Antion. All these huge, massive risks. But the problem is, how do you prepare for some of these things? 
Well, I, I mean, there's some things that you can do, I suppose, and that's what we're talking about here is all this this tech type of stuff, right? Yeah. The, the transparency and, and so on. I think some of the nearshoring, the multiple redundancy, if you can do it in your supply chain, et cetera, which is much easier said than done, right, if we, as we've all discussed. Very difficult stuff to do. But we've got people on the show that are going to talk about that stuff, Of right? course. You and I. I'm we pretty have, sure. But I have 15 sure years do. operational experience. You have 30 or so. So yeah. we can maybe answer some of these questions. But why don't we talk to an expert instead? Yes. Because, you know, these guys are dodging bullets live. And right now we have Vern O'Donnell. He's the chief project officer, product officer. I should say, at Project 44. <laughs> uh, that's why I had Project in my head. <laughs> Vernon, thank you for joining us, man. Yeah, th thanks for having me again. And uh, it is a mouthful. So it I totally get the product <laughs> project. Now, I got before you, because you're a Hoosier, I have to ask you this question. Best basketball movie, Hoosiers, Space Jam, Eddie, or Blue Chips? <laughs> well... Uh, Hoosiers, no, no doubt. My kids would tell you Space Jam, uh, but but Blue Chips holds a special place in my heart because I was at IU and a lot of those guys were in the movie. So, oh, uh, nice. you know, Nick Nick Nolte and Shaq, and then uh, you know that was a good uh, yeah good movie, but definitely Hoosiers. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vernon, first of all, we got to congratulate you. We had Jet on the day after you guys raised. You grew the horn out of your head. You became freight, tech, yeah. unicorns. And I, what should be lost in that, too, is you've made some huge acquisitions, right? Ocean Insights, Clear Metal. Nobody knows about the stresses that are going on in supply chain more than Project 44 right now. Speak to that a little bit about, a little bit about that right now. What are you seeing from your seat? Yeah, so... Uh, so much stress. So I guess let me let me go back a little bit to the acquisition. So Ocean Insights, Clear Metal, both heavily focused in the ocean space. Uh, what became more and more clear to us at Project 44, being really road centric, is that these supply chain problems are having further problems are having further and further upstream. Right, poor congestion crisis. Then you have the Ever Given and, and everything else that's going on. So in order to have true end to end visibility and really understand. Uh, the impact of orders, impact of fulfillment, impact of customer satisfaction. You had to have best in class ocean to go with best in class road. Um, you know, in terms of what we're seeing, it's it's um, I, six months ago, I would have thought by now we'd have a little less chaos in the system. Uh, but I can tell you almost every day it's there's something new, right? A COVID outbreak in a port in China or a crane falls. And, um, you know, that that has just a ripple effect across the entire globe. So it's it's still pretty chaotic out there. Still a heavy need for visibility. I was listening to your uh, your intro and that story about container from South Africa to, to the U.S. To, to went around Asia. We're seeing that all the time. Like mm -hmm. that's sort of uh, kind of really, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Confusing behavior uh, around shipment logic just because of people's big borrow and steal mentality to get anything where they can and how they can uh, to their customers. Yeah. And the interesting thing about that story, Vernon, is the customer was freaking out because they were like, what are you doing? Why am I getting these updates? Why is this thing in Hong Kong? Why is it going this other way? So one of the things that you guys work on there is, you know, this, the pandemic. And it's really important to keep your customer that experience going on there, uh, which is all about uh, efficiency and transparency of, of, of what's going on. So can you talk to that a little bit about, uh, you know, the importance of that with the supply chain and keeping those customer expectations real at this time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we can all. I, actually, I'll tell a quick story. My father was waiting on some medicine uh, last week, and they told him it was going to be there on Friday. And then they called him on Friday and said, "We're actually wrong. It's sitting in the Pacific Ocean. It won't be here for six weeks." Oh. <laughs> and so, so luckily, my dad told us it was not not anything serious. But my dad told his doctor he should buy Project Forty Four visibility, which I thought was uh, a nice plug. <laughs> but I think that's an example of. Right now, expectation setting is so important. And the customer's ability to set expect our customers' ability to set expectations with their customers is critical. Everybody knows that that you know getting capacity is the hardest it's ever been and and having planning uh, disruptions is an almost daily occurrence. So that ability to set expectations, manage your customers, provide a great experience, those are going to be the winners as things start to stabilize because that's going to pay dividends from a, from a long-term relationship and growth perspective. Because right now, the, the ability to, to meet those fulfillment demands, you know, it, it may not be able to change. You can't build a sea vessel and stack it full of containers, right? So, so the best thing you can do is just be really transparent, uh, really proactive, and really collaborative, uh, and ultimately reap those rewards as we come into a more stable environment in the future.
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I've been, um, I've, I've worked for a shipper and I've also worked on the freight side and I've done sales. And in each one of those conditions that I've been in, one of the hardest things was whenever there's like a big rate jump, for example, would be explaining internally and externally why such a thing is happening and also getting people yep. to believe you. And that's where a lot of visibility comes in is in terms of maintaining relationships, being like, look, this really is an accurate picture of the market and we're trying to get you a ahead of it, not rip you yeah. off. You're the you're, yeah. you're in charge of product over there at P40. For what are some of the like? What are some of the screens, dashboards, information that you have right now that's really painting a very clear picture of this uh, this this market? Yeah, no, great great question, great example, and I think that the mindset across supply chains changed so much in the last eighteen months on that. Um, it's you know the whole notion of this being a strategic uh, tip of the spear rather than a cost center. In terms of some of the analytics and some of the products we're building, we're really focused on uh, predictability uh, around order health. Uh, so not across just a single shipment, but multiple legs of multiple shipments and how that ties into a PO level uh, health outcome, which is really, really important, as we talked about before, on that customer expectations. Uh, we've also gone, obviously, really deep into the ocean analytics space uh, through the acquisitions of Clear Metal and Ocean Insights. So understanding, you know, role percentages, uh, the, the, you know, the, an ETA for port discharge and container discharge. So not just port to port, but actually understanding what happens in that port with the container, uh, which is really important, obviously, for the Dre move and the move subsequent to that. Uh, so we've gone really deep into ETA and, and getting really nuanced around that from a use case perspective. We've gone really deep into understanding order health across multiple shipments and multiple legs. Uh, and we're starting to get really, really focused on carrier analytics, uh, but not from a shipper side. Uh, like, look, we want to work with the shippers on that, but I'm much more passionate on we're, we want to get really robust care analytics in the hands of the carriers because so often they're flying blind or at least partially blind. And so if we can provide them an objective source of truth in terms of, you know, how their tracking percentages look, how their, their, you know, their lane coverage looks, route optimization and help them make better network decisions themselves, the shippers benefit and then we benefit because everybody's happy on both sides of the equation. Uh, so we're going really, really deep into the carrier analytics space as well. So Vernon, let's talk about let's talk about this. The Gartner Magic Quadrant. Ooh. You have been named a lead. They've been named a leader. Oh. In, in in that quadrant, right? In the in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Can you can you talk about that? What the importance is there? Yeah, I would say we were named the leader, uh, not a leader. Uh, ah. we're, <laughs> at least from what matters to us. What matters to us. We were uh, uh, we were far and away the the strongest in terms of execution, which is which is really a testament to how we think about our business and and very much around operational nice. focus. Scale. Um, so the importance, obviously, from a marketing standpoint, it's it's great to mm -hmm. to get that credibility and and um, get some kudos from that. And by the way, I would say got a lot of credibility from from Freight Waves and the Freight Tech Twenty Five as well. That was another great you know feather in our cap in terms of finishing number two, uh, three straight years. So so really loved that. But aside from the marketing side of it, it's a testament to how seriously we take the ability to scale alongside our customers. It's not just about having a pretty UI. It's not just about having analytics. Those are really important. But more important is the fact that we have to connect with hundreds of thousands of carriers across multiple geographies, multiple modes. And the company that can execute at scale best is the one that's going to provide more value to their customers. Uh, and that's what we were really most proud of and I think most indicative of how we think about it. And I think most reflective of the fact that our founder and you guys talked to Jet, um, you know, founders from the industry, right? A lot of the initial people who were employed at the company are from the industry. They've been there. They understand the physical problems that supply chains have. And they understand how important execution is. I think that was reflected in our Magic Quadrant result. Yeah, well, and well deserved. Well deserved. Yes. Well, you have this big round. You do these big pickups, right? You're the you're the product officer over there. So sure. when you think about these kind of things and integrating them and, and making that customer experience even better, uh, what, what's on your table for the rest of the year? What are you considering? <laughs> what are we, what are we not considering? Uh, I think we're, we're really considering a couple things. We're focused on uh, one, integrating these solutions and providing a best of breed outcome. Uh, so clear metal had great data science bunch of Stanford educated data scientists. They've done a really a lot of work and in interesting algorithms around data prediction and milestone prediction and data quality. So bringing that to bear with Ocean Insights with the robust richness of their data and in the P44 road network in our platform, that's really a big focus for us uh, for the back half of the year from a practical standpoint. Uh, more, more strategically, we're starting to look really heavily into sustainability analytics and where that's going from a market perspective. We're hearing more and more about that and the importance of that for, for supply chains and supply chain decision making. 
Uh, and then I would also say we're starting to really revisit our roots. Uh, for those of you who know P44, we started full shipment life cycle. So we were, you know, LTL dispatch, LTL rating, LTL 10 or uh, documents, and really all of those components of a shipment beyond just the real time tracking. And, and we're going back to revisit that and thinking about that same one to many uh, API platform concept as it relates to truckload tender and, and kind of more broad ocean booking and how do we play a role in helping bring capacity providers and shippers and 3PLs and freight forwarders together uh, through our platform. So, uh, Vernon, you, you mentioned your roots, right? And and uh, my one of the things that I remember my roots here at, at FreightWaves was I think I might have been the one responsible for putting uh, the capital P and P44 in our first event that got things uh, off to a rocky start there a little oh. bit. But can you can you tell us where did Project 44 come from? Where did P44, why the name? Oh, yo, so <laughs> the P44 name question, I'll do my best to answer this. This predates <laughs> predates me. Uh, but the, the basic concept is Project 44 was founded here in Chicago, which was the inception point for Route 66. Um, and then in the government post-war, uh, World War II, Eisenhower wanted to create this interstate highway system. Not a bad idea. Um, and the very first one was a bypass called Project 44, uh, which was going to connect two disparate parts of Route 66 and make it much more efficient. And so our, our whole goal was API platform. If you think of EDI as the Route 66, and that's how the, kind of how we were thinking about it is APIs and an API platform as the as the future. Uh, we want to be that connective tissue to make that link more efficient, faster, and better. Um, and being a Chicago company, we could look out our old office window and see the the start of Route 66. So it felt very near and dear to our heart and our homes. And very fitting as well. Many supply chains now Excellent. are at their own Route 66 conundrum. That that yeah. course has been uh, has been congested right. and filled. They need these bypasses. So a very fitting that's question. Right. And by the way, I'm looking at the answer on your website. And, uh, and you nailed it. So a little cap yeah. for that one, Vernon. Yeah, I've, been, I've been here three years. I can answer the questions now. That's good. Well, hey, Vernon, people who want to connect with you in that blue room of love you got over there and get uh, Project 44, they, they like what they're hearing. How do I send them over your way? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm back in the office, if you can't tell. So uh, www.project44.com is a great way to connect. Um, I'm not big on social media, but I'm on LinkedIn if you want to reach out to me personally. So you can find me there. Luckily, Vernon O'Donnell is a fairly uh, unique name. Um, and then also in the chat, uh, we have our team in the chat looking here. So please drop a question in there and we'll make sure to gather that and, and hit you back up. So website, LinkedIn, chat, um, they're all available resources for people to get in touch with us. Thank you so much, Vernon. Thanks for joining us today on the show. Take care. Yeah. Have a good one. And now we're going to talk a little bit about benchmarking analytics, especially Ocean right now. You know, I keep thinking back to that import manager who uh, has to bring up, especially one who doesn't import that often, who has to bring up that bill of yeah. 15000 hours for that container yeah. from Shanghai yeah. to Long Beach and explain why he just booked a container for $15,000 without why, being fired. Why is this one <laughs> container going to blow out their transportation exactly. budget? I, there, there's got to be people who are shocked. Patrick Berglund, the CEO, co-founder of, of Zanetta, he would know better than anybody looking at you must be, you must be looking at these rates like a pinball machine hitting tilt. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, unprecedented times. Never seen anything even remotely similar. And uh, you know the the pain the shipper feel uh, on the other side. The forwarders and the carriers are enjoying the best sort of times of their lives. I assume. Now, Patrick, we have the great fortune of not only having you here today, but for those of you who want to hear more from Patrick, he'll be with us on What the Truck on Friday. We'll get even deeper into some of this analytics stuff. But we did just get the information on why P44's name is it is. Now I'm curious about Zanetta. Why is Zanetta, why is Zanetta Zanetta? Yeah, it's it's a, unfortunately not a, a very exciting story, but we, we wanted to find a a short brand name with a .com domain available. And I mean, that's, that's a very <laughs> difficult challenge. So we ended up with uh, playing with the X, as in, I remember we discussed Xerox, right? Yeah. They pulled that off with two Xs even. So I think uh, that's where we landed on Zanetta. Love yeah, it. it only took them 24 tries to find that X. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, let's talk about this. The disruption in Yantian port. So just just opened back up, right? They said it's going to take a few weeks for things to get sorted out with the box, but all the berths are open. They're getting all the ships out of anchor. So it seems like things are clearing up. But what are you seeing from your end? Well, I think uh, Yantian is just one of many incidents we've had 
right, over the last uh, 18 months, I would say. And you guys must uh, remember most of these, whether it's congestions in Long Beach, uh, mm -hmm. strikes in the east coast of the U.S., you've had uh, congestions in Sydney, We've had uh, in in the beginning of of COVID, uh, Brexit happened, right? Right when yeah. China shut down, we had uh, Brexit, and then uh, Ever Given. Uh, I, the list is long, right? And and this is almost like a traffic jam to me. It doesn't matter where it is. Let me give you another example. When 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 China shut down and Europe followed, the we had customers calling us saying that they had thousands of containers full of cargo outside of their warehouse because the goods were not. Um, uh, acquired by the customers, right? So you got to remember in the beginning of COVID, you had a very different situation to what you had now. And that situation led to boxes being piled up in the wrong places of the world. And these, these knock-on effects that all of these have had, things have had over the last 18 months is really what we're struggling with. So, you know, we, we focus on Yantian or Nansha or w w the entire region, right? But but it's been one thing after the next, and it's it's been poking hole in a system running on 100% capacity, full capacity, right? So yeah. it's the only thing that could bring like any relief would be if people stopped consuming goods. And and we're not allowed because we can't travel and, and buy the services we normally do, right? So we spend even more money on goods. And so it's just like a vicious cycle. And yeah, and I'm not sure how, how deep I should go, but this stems, really it stems from 20, 25 years of really weak market conditions. And I mean this, like we have a, an entire infrastructure that is underinvested in yeah. over 25 years because shippers haven't been enjoying ridiculously low rates. It's become cheaper and cheaper to move cargo from one end of the world to another one. When when we started Zenera a few years in, we had rates from Shanghai to Santos for a hundred dollars. Wow. Wow. Right? You, 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 you can't move to the nearest postcoast address that I live in, but you could move from one end to the world to the other one. We, we even had talks about negative rates as long as you paid the terminal handling charges. So so the the struggle, think about this, the struggle the shipping lines have gone through to survive, and they haven't survived because they've gone from through like these what we call waves of consolid consolidations, yeah. right? 20 years ago, you had top five shipping lines at about 27% global market share. The top five today makes up almost 70% of the deep sea trades, right? Yeah, and that and, was cannibalism and, you know, to survive, right? I mean, it was... Right? 100%. Yeah. 100% agree with you. And 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 a little bit, like if I'm going to be a, a bit of a devil's advocate, it's it's a little bit the shipper's own fault because they've mm -hmm. been squeezing their supplier year after year when they negotiated and secured their new deals. And then obviously, don't get me wrong, the the whole sort of COVID is like the perfect storm to, to really showcase how bad this is, right? So if it wasn't for that, maybe it would have taken a few more years and been slightly less painful, but it's inevitable that it would have uh, uh, ended up in a painful situation for the shipper. Yeah. And now they're less, left with three alliances that they can buy from. Think about that. Yeah. Global That's it, trade. Yeah, three. So Pat, Patrick, well, 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 here's the thing too. They got okay, vessel share agreements too, yeah. and these have been for a while. So you think you're booking with 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 one line, you end up yeah. on yeah. a completely different vessel, yeah. and like the whole the whole thing's really murky. In fact, they actually they finally just broke up the box club. Now I don't want to go deep on conspiracy, <laughs> stuff, but there's a yeah. lot of control. I don't. We think can people, do that. We can do that Friday. Well, we, we talk about inland freight here. We'll, we'll, we'll get deeper. We'll yeah, have yeah, yeah. Time. When we you will. talk about inland freight, you're talking about thousands and thousands of carriers here in the United States alone. So you have optionality. You're talking about ocean. Freight, as he's pointing out, just three main alliances. You got McDonald's, you got Burger King, and you got Taco Bell. Yeah, it's 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 really <laughs> it's really not ideal. But I wonder, like, <clears throat> at the current state, Ocean Freight almost reminds me a little bit of Parcel or uh, Express, where you have three players: FedEx, UPS, and uh, UPS and DHL, and then you have a range of niche players, right? But they all make good money, or, or the three of them, right, dominating the market on a global scale. And now, arguably. We've gone through these, I call them waves uh, waves of consolidation, right? But you, you've gone through that over the last 25 years type and, and you reached three alliances. It's like borderline enough for authorities to deem that there is competition in the market, right? But from a shipper point of view, you don't really have many options. When when Home Depot goes out and, and, and talks about chartering their own vessel, something is fundamentally broken. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no doubt about it. No, no doubt. doubt about what it. What is your opinion He's on that? Right. What, like, what is your opinion on Home Depot chartering? Do we? Do you think that we see a world where shippers start taking control of their their own supply chain and at some point become a threat to these big carriers as they say, you yeah. know, we've had enough? Or is that just completely unrealistic? Well, the first internal conversation conversations we had is that even though you charter your own vessel you don't solve the equipment imbalance right you don't how are you going to birth or get like um how are you going to operate the vessel and get slots right different than any other one so there's still the congestions that they will need to deal with as well so i don't think that it's is the solution unfortunately but what i do think it is is a very strong signal to the seller side in this industry that the customers will move to the extremes to do something about this because the 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 trade alone between let's see, let me give you an example asia to europe far east main ports to north europe main ports it's it's currently up 600 percent over the last 12 months 600 percent. we have companies that had you know a logistics budget of a uh, hundred million us dollars now they're paying 300 million us dollars Justifying those cost increases internally, and even for some types of products, it's difficult to move it. There's no more business in it. We have customers that their margins are eroded, right? So yeah, there's there's tons of layers of complexity and challenges that these sort of market movements uh, inflicts on the different types of of businesses. And you know, if you're Nike or Adidas and you're moving sneakers, it's not really a massive deal. Right? But if your cargo vol- value inside a container is thirty thousand US dollars, and now you pay eleven thousand dollars to move the box, then you have a huge problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, Patrick, you said that a lo- uh, that a-, a certain amount of the blame for this break in the infrastructure and the supply chains, et cetera, because and driving down to now only three really choices in maritime a certain amount of that blame is the shippers but a, a, a lot of that blame can be laid right on the carriers themselves right we used we used to always say that the, the stupidest person in the room sets the rates at times and that's what really hurts things and, but it's more of like the most ignorant right and with the transparency and the data like Zanetta brings and others bring uh, it, it, we should be better at this and, and shouldn't shippers be and carriers be looking at this and doing a better job of explaining why rates might be really low at this specific time and what those dangers are yeah. to prevent this from happening further? It, you're absolutely right. And, and we even wrote uh, an article about this uh, way back where we questioned whether the carriers are their own worst enemy. But the, the, the challenge they have is predicting how demand will look like three, four years down the road, because that's how you place the orders for new vessels, new builds, right? And you don't know if it's gonna be a 2009 crisis or a COVID crisis or whatever it is when you deploy all of that capacity. So that's what happened in the last crisis in, in, in 2008, 2009. There was full order books, a lot of vessels hitting the market, and then demand plummets, but you're pushing out capacity in the market. And then you have, let's say, partially state-financed f- uh, companies, right? If you think about some of these yeah. uh, Asian players sure. who don't necessarily compete on the same terms as a stock-listed company in, in Europe or US. So there are many, many layers to this and the complexity to, to, to balance supply and demand is, is very difficult. Let me give you one last example of that. Actually, it's a good one because when President Trump was elected president, most people didn't believe it would happen, right? Then it happened and the first thing he started doing is pushing a trade war with China, which allow, made US importers front load cargo on Trans-Pacific Eastbound, which created a capacity squeeze, which made rates skyrocket. If you could predict that three, four years in advance and plan what kind of vessel capacity you would like to own as a shipping line and deploy it on those trades, then I would agree with you that they should be good at balancing supply and demand. But that's been historically historically the problem. I believe now they are so few and they're so swift at pulling capacity out that we won't go back to the old market in, in the foreseeable future, in years and years to come. Wow. 
Pat, Patrick, th- I mean, I could talk Ocean Trade with you all day. I am <laughs> yeah. so happy that we get 20 more minutes with you on Friday because there's so much that we could get into. There's so much I want to ask you, and I especially want to talk to you about the proof of concept on how you're addressing challenges in the global shipping industry because I know you are, and a lot of that is just giving information so they can communicate to other departments what's going on with the benchmarking and the, the analytics that's going on. Like we mentioned that example of the shipping manager used to booking that rock bottom free, 1200 bucks from uh, from Shanghai to Long Beach. Now they got to yeah. go, oh, it's $15,000 and not get fired. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into it deeper. But in the meantime, because we do have to sign off with you, where should people go to get some more information? Sonero.com, Senero, and they will get tons of information. And you'll, you'll definitely find it there because that's how the name was formed. They had to find the open website, and it was <laughs> oh, there you go. Patrick, Senero. thank you so much. We appreciate it. Check out their stuff, especially if you need guidance in the market. Both of those companies are fantastic. That's yeah. why we brought them on guests on this very show. If I was still on that side of it and not here at the desk, I would be bugging finance or whoever to prove it. Get me some Zanetta and get me some P44. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I would be too. I absolutely would young, be too. You got to have that visibility. You need the to understand. It's so rapidly, so volatile. The pendulum yeah. swings so hard in this business. It's like a medieval torture device. It is. And if your head's on the wrong side in the middle, it's going to get lopped off and Just, it may not even be your fault. Just the ability to have that data and have those explanations to keep my customers' expectations real and explain to them what is going on and why, invaluable. Folks, Invaluable. What the Truck comes to you three days a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays when there's not these virtual events. Noon Eastern time, you can find it on Freightwaves TV, Freightwaves social media, uh, tv.freightwaves.com. Of course, it's always available on demand, just as every session is at this event. You can find What the Truck, look up What the Truck on your favorite podcast player if you want audio only, or if you want every single Freightwaves podcast, plus all the sessions from this event, all on one feed. Just look up Freightcast. What a deal is that, right? It's, it's awesome. free, just like everything else. Now, you want even more What the Truck, we get a newsletter, comes out every Every Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, sure. FreightWaves.com slash WTT. I rated the top five trucking movies since uh, sure. the 80s in, the, in this week. I had to exclude the 70s because it would be too easy. It'd be like White Light Fever or Cotton yeah, yeah, Smoking yeah, the yeah, Band. Yeah. I mean, They'd all be in the 70s. <laughs> then you look at the 80s. So this is it's a kind of a rough list, but some gems. I grew up with these ones. I had number okay. five, Black Dog, Patrick Swayze, Meatloaf. Cannot argue with that. Patrick Swayze and 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 and, and Meatloaf with the truck. Yeah. Lured back in the cab. Be tricked into five. being a mule. We have the Ice Road out now on Netflix at number four with Liam Neeson and uh, Gertie, who is basically like the Kenny of the movie. I feel bad for <laughs> Gertie. Stephen King's Maximum Overdrive, 1986. Number two was Joyride. Hey, Karen to Karen. And over the top with Sly Stallone about fatherhood home, arm wrestling. Arm wrestling. Arm wrestling and driving truck. Stay tuned. We got more event coming in a few hours here. Then we're going to draw that cooler at the end of the event. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Find him at Michael Vincent. Tell them how to be the rest of the day. Peace and love, everyone. Spread it everywhere.